family. And the exact line when they're having this big discussion about what to do with Micah is, um, there, Veronica says, there are a few situations that can't be resolved given love and determination. Like, yeah. so just all let's sit down and figure this out together. Yes, yes. and not all families operate this way. This no. one does. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Sally Koslow. I'm going to be honest, Sally and I have a shared past. We were, both worked at Mademoiselle Magazine somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s. We're still young, though, folks. Keep in mind, we're still young. Don't do any math here. And it's been a pleasure reading her books since she's been published in 2007. The Real Mrs. Tobias, which we're going to talk to today, is one of my Book Reporter Bets on selections for 2022. And this is what our reviewer, Rebecca Monroe, had to say about it. This is an astute, authentic novel, but it's also one that will have you laughing out loud with sympathy, mirth, and glee. Coslow wastes no chance to reveal some universal truth, usually delivered on an heirloom platter of wit. So with that, <laughs> Sally, I welcome you. Uh, yeah. Welcome to talks to. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. I hadn't heard that. That's wonderful. Yeah, so totally nails it. I loved every piece of the review. So let's start by you telling us about The Real Mrs. Bias. Give us your elevator pitch about the book. Uh, the, it's a family saga, and what makes it unique is that it's told from the point of view of three women who've married in. The oldest is a woman named Veronica. She's the matriarch of the family. Then there's her daughter-in-law. Her name is Melanie. She goes by Mel. And she has a daughter-in-law whose name is Bertie. So we've got three generations and we explore in the book, the daughter-in-law, mother-in-law relationship. And honestly, I never felt I'd read a book that looked at families this way. I love a family saga. I mean, I just love family stories. And I couldn't think of one. And, and my relationships in that regard have been very important to me. I've been a mother-in-law for longer than I've had a mother, sadly. Um, and sadly, because my, my mother passed away pretty young. And I have two daughters-in-law. And, you know, I became a mother-in-law, which is freaky. So, um, sorry, I just heard Alexa telling me to go for a walk. <laughs> sorry, Alexa, I'm busy. Um, in any event, um, that was why I wrote the book. It's a, it could have been written many different ways, but I... I really wanted to refract this relationship because I think for many women, it's extremely important and sometimes tricky, challenging, painful even. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Veronica is the matriarch and I just love the way she sort of sets the tone because the person who is the matriarch sort of does set the tone of what is going to happen and everybody else has to play into it, whatever. So tell us about her and her role as the matriarch, who she is as a result, because she's a terrific character. Well, she has appointed herself the person who keeps the nuclear codes for the family. She is a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. And she's, uh, she can tell a joke, but she can't, she's not soft and funny. You know, she could repeat a joke it's, it's rather than offer a uh, repartee, you know, on, on command. Um, and she's got a wonderful relationship with her husband, whose name is David. But she's a tough cookie. Mm -hmm. She's a really tough cookie. And when she um, uh, met her, well, who turned out to be her daughter, and when she met Mel, she really didn't take her too seriously in the beginning because Mel came from the Midwest. She came from St. Paul, Minnesota, and a place of big, pale people eating big, pale portions in, you know, in the point of view of, of Veronica, who is European. She was, um, she was a hidden child during World War II, and she and her mother made it here after the war, but she bears the scars of someone who has lived through that experience of um, having been hidden as a baby and being a three-year-old, I think I, if I'm doing the math right, whose mother showed up and then took her to America. It's a, it's a, it's a both a miracle and a tremendous shock to go through something like that. So she is steely, flinty, uh, a tough mother-in-law. Uh, definitely, definitely. So then she is a psychotherapist, which makes it very interesting because Mel, 
her daughter-in-law is also a psychotherapist, but more of a social worker. She's not sort of on the same plane as Veronica. So tell us about why you chose to have them both have the somewhat same pro profession of looking at people and trying to help people. Well, I happen to live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in a building that's just loaded with psychiatrists, <laughs> that and Columbia University professors. And um, there, I've met quite a few analysts and shrinks in my time in New York. And there is a pecking order. There's even within that community, there's a pecking order of which analytic society we belong to. So uh, Veronica looks down on her daughter-in-law because she has an MSW degree, which is not fair because you can be a wonderful therapist with that degree, but mm -hmm. she happens to be of the opinion that, okay, that she an MSW degree is good for setting up home health care, but not for messing with people's brains. That's so she, and uh, while, while Veronica would refer to the people who sit on her couch as patients, uh, Mel would see them as clients. Mm -hmm. A bit of a difference there. So there's a snooty attitude. Snooty attitude. There's a pecking order even to this, into their careers as well. And then we've got the third Mrs. Tobias is Birdie. She's from the Midwest. She's now living in Brooklyn. She's not a native New Yorker. And it brings to her some cultural shock when she does come to the city. Now, does she embody any of what you felt when you came to New York from North Dakota? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, all three characters have a little bit of me in them. People who know me well, who've read this book can see that. But um, I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. I cannot deny it. In fact, I'm extremely proud of it. it really mm -hmm. helped me being a magazine editor. Sure. And um, um, even though there, my husband and I had certain commonalities, we're of the same religion, we're both Jewish, I had a very different background. I came from a town of 50,000 people, and it was mostly Scandinavian. It was not, um, it was not an environment where people uh, praised one another a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you sometimes joke and say, well, I was raised before self-esteem was invented. Because you know, it was just, you know, people would, my parents in that part of the world are more inclined to um, not compliment their children excessively. Um, and I, I did, so Bertie had a very different background than mine because Bertie grew up in a farm. I did not grow up in a farm. I grew up in basically a suburban household. There just wasn't a suburb. There just wasn't a city nearby. Um, but um, I, I did find it shocking in many respects to move to New York. I mean, one of the things that shocked me the most, Carol, was partly because I worked at Mademoiselle and we were trying to get people to buy things, um, was that how everything in New York was engineered to make you want things. Yes. You didn't even know you wanted it. took no. you to buy a gorgeous window, you know, at, at um, Bergdorf's or something and you're salivating. So um, there was a lot of culture shock for me when I moved here. And they get a little parade for us. And it's a big deal that we were in town. I bet. And what I came back though, noticing though, and I remember probably was two editors in chief beyond this that I actually was verbalizing this. And I said, you know, we've got the magazine of what we present on the pages, which actually available in stores in most of the country and really who the person is. And we've got and who the advertisers are. So we've got three different messages going on at any given time. So we're doing this. You want to have this. But this isn't the kind of days where you could go online and buy it. It was, you had to come to New York to get it. This You had oh, to go to So I knew that. I mean, I, I, all through high school, I wanted to look like the girls in Seventeen Magazine. But those clothes weren't in the stores. Mm -hmm. Just weren't. And I, it was frustrating to me. We used to do these on location shows and I was like, well, you realize we have none of the clothes that are in the magazine here. And it was, then we used to do TV too, talking about the advertisers outfits. And I remember one time I was in um, some parts of Michigan and it was a freezing cold, but we wore the advertisers outfits to promote them. And they said, and what prompted to you to wear this today? I want to sit there and say, because I'm an idiot because it's freezing <laughs> out and I'm going to this little short sleeve outfit. So it was a cultural um, look going across the country. And I appreciated it when we started this site because I understood the country instead of just understanding the two coasts, if that makes sense. But it has it has flattened out though considerably. Yes. Because I yes. remember when I went back to my last high school reunion that I attended, that the same things were on sale at the Gap mm -hmm. that that in Fargo that were on sale in New York. 
because mm -hmm. you know there there were you know many more big box stores that were everywhere selling the same stuff. I mean, not completely the same stuff. I know that they have algorithms that tweak it, but um, it's it's and there are so many more television networks and television mm -hmm. stations and movies mm -hmm. all open in the same theaters everywhere. So you know it's flattened out considerably. But in the olden days, when I was a child, it wasn't that way. It wasn't that way. And now you can also buy online and you can buy just about anything like, you know, online. You could just go, oh, I'm going to go to that store. I'm going to buy that. But a lot of really bad dresses for my niece's wedding. I put one on and my son said to me, oh, and now I can make three flower girl dresses about the, the rest of it that's hanging around. This is very funny. But we also have a child in this book and Bertie's a mom to Alice. And when she leaves the city at one point with Alice, we won't get into too much about what that is, but they leave town and she's torn between what's working for her and what's working with her child. And I think that's a typical mother relationship, but also with these three Mrs. Tobiases, it's like, which one is she going to be? Or is she going to be somebody else? Am I right? Well, I'm not sure I'm following you completely because I'm not sure which Tobias you're thinking about, but um, the young uh, one, the youngest right. one. I think she's trying to decide who she's supposed to be, right. how and she's supposed to fit in. There, there's an incident that triggers all this, that, that her husband does something pretty dumb and maybe not legal. And I don't want to say what it is, but, um, and, and he doesn't none. And this, this is a family that's very in your face, the New York branch of the family. And they eventually essentially have like a family meeting, you know, a, a dinner at, the the oldest one, the matriarch's house, and they're all given advice, you know, to to this guy, and um, that's very smothering for Bertie. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one thing to get advice on a benign subject, but this is something really important, and um, and he's not listening to her either. So she feels that she needs a break, and she beats it out of town with her daughter. And this is extremely upsetting to everyone in the family perhaps the most upsetting to her mother-in-law because mm -hmm. she's become very, very attached to her granddaughter. These two women, Mel and Bertie, got married really young. So that, um, I mean, in some parts of the country it doesn't seem that young, but in New York it does mm -hmm. to get married when you're in your 20s. And so at, in her early 40s, Mel's a grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, she was completely gobsmacked by how wonderful it's turned out to be something I can speak with experience from. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's really mortified when she, when this little girl goes to Iowa and she certainly, she wants the marriage patched up. She wants Bertie and Alice to come back. And uh, so does her mother-in-law, the matriarch. And so this is another big deal. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal of what's going to happen. I do like that the tone is we are a family and the exact line when they're having this big discussion about what to do with Micah is, um, there, Veronica says, there are a few situations that can't be resolved given love and determination. Like, yes. so just all let's sit down and figure this out together. Yes. yes. And not all families operate this way. This no. one does. No, 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 no. So the family act, act, um, interactions are make for good storytelling. And you have both long traditions here and everyday experiences. Did you play a balance of those as you were writing of this is how we do Friday evenings. This is how we do every day sitting and coloring with um, little uh, Alice, like the balance of what happens in the book. Well, I, I don't think I did it consciously. I think that when you're, when you write, you don't want to repeat yourself. If you mm -hmm. feel like you have one big holiday celebration, you don't have to have every holiday on the calendar. Mm -hmm. And if you, you have one good night ritual showing, you don't have to do it every night. So I, I think that that, that comes naturally to writers it's most I don't think anyone would map it out. Map it out in advance. Well, you know, matriarchs often set the tone for the family. This is who yeah. we are. When you go meet your mother-in-law for the first time, it's who we are. I remember I walked down the driveway. It was 4th of July. They were having a far party where everyone in the family is going to be there. I'd been dating my husband maybe three months. Okay. Walked down the driveway. His brothers and sisters walk by me and they go, he's in the house. And his mother walks over and just, oh, it's so nice to meet you. Oh, da, da, da. And I was like, this is going to be okay. Because uh -huh. of the way she had sat and greeted me. And over the summer, over the course of three months, we lost both my mom and my mother-in-law. And they were the ones who had put in the place of the generations of these are the traditions and the values and everything is going on. And all of a sudden I suddenly realized reading this book, I'm like, oh my gosh, am I the matriarch of the family? I mean, this is like terrifying because I never thought of myself in that role because we had both of them. And I think that 
I, you know, when you, when you're reading about this, you all of a sudden are thinking about what am I setting as the tone? What am I setting of what's going on? And I'm sure there are a lot of people that are in my position that there aren't a, a, no, you know, other parents at this point in their lives. And what am I doing in this big role? Well, you know, I'm pretty old. My husband's pretty old to still have a mother. She's mm -hmm. my husband's mother is a highly functional 98 year old woman still driving, still extremely up to date on politics and uh, plays a mean card game. She's a fabulous bridge player. She it's sad because she's out with most of her friends. So her social life isn't quite what it was. That's probably the only thing about it that's changed. But you know, and I mean, I hate to put a jinx on it. But I mean, I do worry. You know, mm -hmm. One of these days, she might not be there. And I don't know who's going to inherit the mantle. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I are the youngest ones in the family. So I somehow always see myself that way. And my husband has two wonderful older sisters, but one lives in Chicago, another's in New York. She's got a great big family. It may not ever be quite the same. Mm -hmm. And I remember on my, on my father's side of the family, there was a wonderful aunt who took on that role to keep us all together. And when she passed away quite young, nobody inherited it. Mm -hmm. We all just kind of went our different ways. So it is something to think about. It is. And I had never thought of myself as I was Mrs. Fitzgerald and I have two boys and someday they'll have a Mrs. Fitzgerald as well. I was kind of thinking about all this, but boy, look, reading the book, I was more, wait, this is all the roles that people do assume along the way, just because of, you know, age or where they are in their lives or, you know, whatever. My parents were the youngest. They're both the youngest of like five and eight. And as a result, when I saw my cousins, I said, we have to figure a way to still get together. Because there is no, well, we were also kind of like being a little bit pun when we were standing there going, uh, how about if we do no more funerals, going to be us. <laughs> so mm -hmm. let's not, I like, push this, my dad's still alive, but on that side of the family, there's nobody. And I said, so let's not get together like this. How about if we have a party at my house? But you really start thinking about those relationships and what they built with over holidays and how you actually saw each other as children. And now you see each other as adults. And that's a whole you know different dynamic as well. It certainly is. You're, but you play it so well in the book because each of these women are completely distinct in who they are. And then there comes a point also where Veronica really needs to have Mel's help because she's in yeah. a situation that you would think she could totally handle on her own and she can. not Right. She just doesn't have the gift for handling that particular situation well. And it comes very naturally and easily to Mel. And so that allows them to forge, um, a new path in their relationship, mm -hmm. but um, it, it wasn't easy for Veronica. Veronica's much more comfortable at work and comfortable when everything was going well with her husband, but you know, he has an illness mm -hmm. and um, it, it breaks her down. It's mm -hmm. rough. Mm -hmm. And it's rough because it's, you're going to have to go hear things that you don't want to have to hear. And you're going to have to hear a progress thing that you're not going to want to hear. And how's, how are you going to navigate that? What are you going to do? And it's not like, and it's also your life is going to change dramatically. And are you ready for it? We went Never. through this as my mom was failing and it, it's happened very, very quickly. All of a sudden you start sitting there going, okay, what's my role here now? Am I dispatching information? Am I helping everybody understand the information? What exactly is going on? So but you did a very good job of bringing up all the different relationships and melding them together and then really seeing um, the hard parts about everything as well. Like Mel just wanting to be able to play with her grandchild and she can't. And I know your children are, and I believe they're both in Europe. Your sons are both in Europe yes. at this part. Yes, and they are. It's crazy, but it's true. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's true. And it's like, okay, when I get together with them, the children will be a little older. What will end up happening? What's the relationship? And they're fabulous relationships, but by the same token, they'll change. They'll change a little bit or tweak a little. And I think the way you're bringing up a lot in the book is the tweaks and the values and the traditions, but then there are tweaks along the way that everybody's got to work, um, do to make it work for them. So, it, yes, like it or not, you know. <laughs> like it or not, you're on the airplane, like it or not, you know. So this is your sixth novel. Has this gone any easier, the writing, as time has gone on? Is it any simpler? Uh, yes and no. Um, but I keep raising the bar for myself. The first book that I wrote, I never really thought there would be a second book. It was just a novelty to pass the time while I was looking for a new job. But I never wound up finding the job that I felt was right for me because I had been an editor in chief of a couple of different magazines and 
Um, I had a nice period of time to, with a nice long severance to look for a new job. But the jobs that came up were either in places that I found undesirable. I had no, my, I had just become an empty nester and I really didn't want to have a job in Milwaukee mm -hmm. or Kansas City, but not that those aren't nice places. Um, when, when my husband was here, it just, just seemed wrong. Or the magazine jobs that were available in New York, at least that came up for me, were very celebrity oriented. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to um, submit myself to Kardashian worship. It just wasn't what I had prepared myself for, mm -hmm. for all those years. So t as time went by, then I wrote another book. And then after that, by that time, magazines had started to, you know, pass away, they started evaporating. So it just worked out that I became an author rather than a magazine editor, something I would have never predicted because I had never written any fiction before. I was always about nonfiction, magazine articles. Yeah, about I people, about things, about how to do this, how to do that, how to navigate through life. And that's the reason I think you do such a good job, especially with a book like this, because it's a subject you would have written on Thanksgiving with your mother-in-law. <laughs> but, but also, even when we would, I was the editor of McCall's for a long time. Even when we would do a subject, say like lung cancer, what made, it wasn't always just a factual story. There was always a personal story to go with it. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, to bring it down, to bring it to a personal level for the reader. And that was just the format of the magazine that I felt was most appealing and would get people involved in the, involved with the magazine the most. So um, while I didn't write most of those stories because I, didn't you, as an editor in chief, you don't have too much time left to actually write. Mm -hmm. uh, although I always wrote the cover lines, the, the blurbs on the front. And I always felt those were, you know, sometimes could be a little bit clever, a little bit witty. And I felt like that particular talent could carry over to, um, to magazine, to uh, novel writing. Yes. Yes. Same kind of witty things you put on the cover, like great sense and sentences. They really pull it together. Sometimes, sometimes they do. Yeah. Many, 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 you know, and it's like you write characters so well, both men and women. And when you do you sketch them out in advance or do you know who they are and what they are? Or do they come to you as you're writing? Like, did you know these three women? Well, they came to me in my writing. I kind of had a, I had an idea of who they were. I don't always see them like I knew Bertie was tall and blonde and beautiful. She was a yoga instructor who didn't even realize how beautiful she was and, you know, kind of a reserved Midwesterner, not given to be loud in the life of the party. And um, I felt that Mel was someone a little bit eccentric, mm -hmm. a little bit unconventional, someone who would, you know, be less likely to buy her clothes at Saks than at a craft fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, someone who um, liked to wear a lot of crazy jewelry that she bought on her vacations rather than something from Tiffany's. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I, I, so, I mean, I've known people like these people. So I think of, you know, different people in my life often. And um, for, um, for Veronica, I felt, you know, this was a very elegant woman. This was a woman who was, who would even, uh, she wouldn't own a pair of jeans, mm -hmm. you know, even on the weekend, like I show her on a weekend when, when she's um, not expecting her daughter-in-law Mel to visit her and she's wearing a starch white blouse tucked into a pair of tailored gabardine pants and an Hermes belt. Now who wears that on the weekend? Not me, but you know, this, this woman is always very turned out. Mm -hmm. She's just very crisp. So there were, there were, you know, I, I thought of different people in my life more mm -hmm. than anything else. And even sometimes what people wear says so much about them. Like you could just oh. see their clothes and you get it. You get it like completely. Yes. And there aren't too many descriptions of clothes in this mm -mm, book. Mm -mm. Maybe one per person. I think I do describe that um, uh, Bertie lives in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn, you know, for a particular party she's going to go. She went, she'd gone to a Halloween party the previous year. Brooklyn, the Brownstone Brooklyn does Halloween up really big. Yes. Parades and they decorate their brownstones. And so, and, and I described a certain pair of clogs that all the women were wearing that she found some on eBay, you yes. know, because clogs can be really expensive. And, and they were wearing long, you know, sort of 
it looked like sister wives kind of dresses <laughs> and it doesn't sound very sophisticated or sexy but it is mm -hmm, there's exactly. a certain look that's indigenous to her tribe the tribe that she and she had very mixed feelings about this on the one hand she thought it was obnoxious on the other hand she didn't want to miss it <laughs> i don't want to not be part of this please don't let me not be part of it yeah that's really <laughs> Do you know where the book's going all the time when you start or does it the story just move you along as well? Well, it's more the latter. I really admire people who can sit down before they start to write and map out a whole book. Mm -hmm. I don't have that gift. Mm -hmm. I, I, the more characters feel real to me, the more they can kind of start communicating with me like hand puppets and tell me what they would do. And I set up, set down obstacles for them. And then I think, well, knowing what I know about this person, and some of it's in my head, it's not all on the page. How would she react? Mm -hmm. and then, um, then it all comes together. And it all comes together. Now, do you do a messy first draft and then edit, or do you try to get it all locked out down as you go? Both. Mm -hmm. um, I am constantly rewriting. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I don't get very far because I'll look over what I'd written the day before mm -hmm. and I spend most of the day rewriting it. Mm -hmm. So I sort of, you know, two step forwards, one step back. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I not, so I do way more than two drafts. I wouldn't even know how many drafts because I don't do it in complete drafts. I, I think that's the editor in me that's functioning because once I have something down on paper, then I try to turn myself into an editor and look at it dispassionately and ruthlessly and see, you know, we don't need this adverb. And oh, I've repeated the word still four times in two paragraphs. And you look, looking, I clean up my act before I let myself move ahead. Mm -hmm. so it's both. Yeah. And, you know, having the editorial background of how this needs to look in the end, you're, you've edited people before, but by the same token for yourself, you're sitting there, what can I do? How can I fix it now? Why do we don't have to wait till later? It's a lot harder to edit yourself. But I think I'm better at it than than some people. I think mm -hmm. I'm pretty, pretty ruthless, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know I'll challenge myself to try to do it because you know why I really like that. Mm -hmm. I really like editing. It's, yeah. I like writing. I think editing is much easier than actual first drafts are what are really hard for me. Some you know some if I've written three full pages in a day, I think oh this was a good day. Where some people can write ten pages, fifteen mm -hmm. pages. I can't. Yeah, sometimes people do it, and they say this is just the messy first draft, and now I've got to go back. I've got to go back to the yeah. whole thing and fix yeah. it. Well, by the time I finish, I, I it's pretty clean for me. But mm -hmm. that's because I've been rewriting the whole time, constantly, and it might take me six months more than somebody else because that my tends to be slow process. But sometimes editing yourself, I find, is different than an editor editing. There was somebody oh, yeah. um, who I interviewed who, I think they'd done eight takes on the book. And the book really needed a ninth because now there were all these choppy things that worked well, but it didn't go like this. And they might've run out of time or whatever, but sometimes you do it so much, but if you're not doing it yourself or somebody's giving that much information, it just doesn't flow. And in your head, it's flowing if you're writing like as an editor as well, as you're editing yourself. Well, sometimes if people are in writing workshops, mm -hmm. they will, you know, bring in a chapter and that they, on its own, the chapter or, you know, the, the, you know, the, whatever that maybe it's not a chapter, maybe it's just a hunk of a book. It works well, but you then, it's entirely different when you assemble the whole thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you know, books have to have, there's this concept of books having a, an arc. Mm -hmm. They think it's called an Aristotelian arc. And so like it builds, 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 builds. And then it, does, it can't build like in the middle, like a steeple of the church. It has to build, you know, pretty, you have to start winding it up maybe when you're a third or a fourth of the way to the end. Mm -hmm. I see that. You're blind to that when you're looking at each chapter individually. Yeah. And you got to sit there and say like, but it's the same thing as the magazine. The magazine's got to have a flow to it. I think we learned a lot being in magazines. It's got to have flow. There's the front of the book. There's the middle of the book. There's the back of the book. And when you think about that, it all still needed to work together. There are times where there just wasn't that zing story and we needed the zing and it wasn't there, but you didn't know it till you put it all up on the wall <laughs> and then said to somebody, go do something. <laughs> <'Cause we don't laughs> <have> it. <laughs> it's missing, you know? So you also wrote a novel of nonfiction called Slouching Towards Adulthood, 
that I felt that the kind of info that would have been a great column in a women's magazine, oh. all that great <laughs> info. And it was like you drew a lot of experience into one place. And I was in the supermarket the other day and I was looking at magazines at the checkout counter and every single one either had a celebrity on the cover of it. Like, let's face it, Serena made her announcement about what she was going to do with tennis in Vogue magazine with a cover story. I mean, just think about like how crazy that is compared to when it would be Kim Alexis or such and such a model on the cover of the magazine. There are fewer and fewer models on the covers of the magazine. And there are all these celebrity magazines, one whole magazine about Anne Hesh, one whole magazine about this. And I'm like, really? Is this really what it's come to? But it is like these standalone things, I guess, for fans. But I can't figure out how many fans are going to buy some of these at the shop right in Gillette. You know what I mean? Really? I'm sure there'll be so many special ones on Queen Elizabeth and, her, yes. you know, the Duchess of Cambridge. I don't think she, now she's the Wales. Yeah, Duchess of Kate Middleton. Something of Wales, yeah. And she's now the Princess of Wales. Um, yes, there because, you know, many magazines have ended. I, mm -hmm. I just read that Parade Magazine, for example, is going digital. That really? just was announced two, three days ago. I mean, and that's something that many people have known for their whole life, tucked into their Sunday newspaper, and now it's mm -hmm. going to be digital. It'll be a very different experience. Mm -hmm. and, well, you had, you had the ultimate beginning of that with McCall's. You had the beginning. When, when I sat there and I said, wait, who are we bringing in? Rosie O'Donnell is now going to be the editor of Magazine. You yeah. didn't make that up. You did not. That was so crazy. I mean, I couldn't have made that. So, so my first novel, Little Pink Slips, was a, not about Rosie, but it was about a unusual celebrity who takes over the magazine for the editor in chief. Is it? Were you shocked when you heard that, or had there been rumblings that they were going to do something? Was there, or is this? We we decided we're going to bring in Rosie O'Donnell. Like, who was in that editorial meeting making that decision? <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> um, yeah, for about six weeks, there were rumblings, but at first I just couldn't believe it because, okay, it was a no brainer, although a brilliant move, you know, to have Oprah start a magazine because mm -hmm. you could basically trip any woman in the United States and say, what does Oprah Winfrey stand for? And they would be able to articulate something kind of similar, you know, for, for self-improvement and, and um, making yourself a better person and, and spirituality and so on. But if you would ask about Rosie, I don't know what people would say, oh, she's funny or she likes crafts or she didn't have the same branding, the same mm -hmm. message. And then if you, if you lived in some, if you were on the fringes of the industries that she's in, you might have known that she was gay. Mm -hmm. so, um, that was, she was, at the time the magazine was launched with her name on it, she was still in love with Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. right. So it did seem like a very good idea to me. Also, I immediately had the entertainment editor on our staff check and found out that her talk show was doing very poorly. Mm. It was going to be canned and she wanted something else. You know, I think she was inspired by Oprah to mm -hmm. begin with. She mm -hmm. wanted something. There were just many, many reasons not to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but um, I was the only person who brought them up. Right. One else agreed with that. We had a brand new president at the time. He was excited to make his mark. He was maybe a little naive because we found out later that Rosie had been turned down by many major publishing companies because they just didn't see it, didn't think of it. So, you know, that version, of, and then they, they took this, they took, they, the company delivered Rosie, a magazine called Rosie with Rosie O'Donnell as its editor. And they gave it to the McCall's readership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, Carl's readership was pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we once wrote, published a wonderful article about two nuns in New Jersey who got married and wow, did we hear from our readers. They just weren't ready for that story. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, many people might have doubted this, but it went ahead. It lasted for nine months and it, I lost my job, but mm -hmm. um, I was then hired by another company to do a startup magazine. I was hired by hers to do a magazine that represented Lifetime Television. So I was able to rehire quite a few wonderful right. people on my staff. And that's the thing is, we had a very communal 
way when we were working at the magazine, especially my years at Mademoiselle. I mean, I'm still friends with people that I met there because we all grew up together. We all were doing the same kinds of things. Um, one of my friends, Beverly Wilson, has been a friend for like over 40 years and we still run things by each other. We talk a couple of times right. a week and it's so much fun to see how many of those relationships were built. And when, when you and I saw each other, when I was doing this and you were started writing, I was, we just sat down at the table at lunch and mm -hmm. just started chit-chatting about everything, who we knew, what they were up to, whatever. It was a great experience in my life to be at Mademoiselle because the person who edited my copy was Mary Cantwell. Mm -hmm. And she was such a brilliant writer. So even though I was completely intimidated by her and we didn't really have that much of a one-to-one -one relationship, I could learn a lot from what her comments were on the pieces that I wrote. Yeah, and, it, and it, there was an eye. There was an eye for what was gonna happen. I feel like right now too, um, the life is about pop culture, social media, how you're supposed to look. And it's this very, um, oh, I'm not the only person that's saying this, um, a manicured way of going through life, a groomed way of looking at everything. And nothing's ever bad. Everything's always wonderful. I look at these children. No children cry. No one <laughs> cries. Everyone's always happy. My children did cry when they were little. There were like little temper tantrums and stuff, but you don't see those. You just see the manicured wonderful. And I think it's really super hard for people, young people today, because those articles are not being written like what we used to write about this is a rough time. How are you going to get through it? How to navigate? Not quite the same way. Not done. Quite I don't the same think way. that there. Um, I mean, women's magazines were very special because, mm -hmm. first of all, they gave you all this incredible health coverage, which you don't get on television because it goes by way too fast and it's not as in depth, and you don't get it. Um, you're not going to read a whole book mm -hmm. on, on something that, like some illness that you don't know you have, and people would literally you know tear out the magazine and give their sister a copy of an article that could possibly save her life mm -hmm. so, you know there were there was well and i look at so many publications now and i look at content they have content basically to me content is sort of like a magazine article without the fact checking and mm -hmm. uh, you know w without the deep research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's surface. It's everything kind of surface and who's really doing it the best and who's going to put challenges out. And you don't see that that much. It's and like and a lot of it. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I often feel like I'm reading just a, 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 a press release that came into someone's office and they put it whole mm -hmm. to their publication. Well, it's interesting when I friend was um, working, I forget what industry he's in. And he said, you know, it's really funny because everybody says the white house said, and he goes, we all got the same release in the morning. So the White House said, it's not like we had some special access. We had all got the same sheet of paper. We could say the White House said. And as a result, he said, it was really interesting to see how that would then get interpreted yeah. wherever everybody was. So the thing I really loved about it, though, is um, your book, it looks at life and it's often messy. And it's not always that manicured and wonderful. And I liked that because they're set with a problem at the beginning and how the family going to look at it and what's going to happen and what's going to go. And then there are other things that happen in the family along the way. And I liked that because it was realistic. And a lot of stuff is a little too pat and it's a little too manicured of what it's going to be. Well, life is messy. Mm -hmm. Families yeah. are messy. I mean, you know, there's always something going on in my family with one side or the other. Mm -hmm. It's a special occasion out in California, one of my nephews and um, some people, I, my kids can't go because one's in Berlin and with his family and the other's in Paris and somebody else can't go because it's homecoming at their son's school and somebody else can't go because her son's playing football and it's a really important game. She wants to be there, doesn't want to miss it herself. I mean, it's, and so there won't be the same representation that everyone had giving this, you know, in, behind this that had hoped for. Yeah. Yeah, it's even when my mother in passed away, there was one family that was very close to the family. And they said, we're doing a family reunion that weekend with all of us. And we do that a couple of times a year. And this is one of the weekends we're doing it. And it's nice to see that people were that like into getting together and all being in the same place. And we're all traveling. I think they were all going to Boston from wherever they were in the country. It was kind of nice to see it, that, you know, that was, that's the kind of thing that they would want to do. So was the title always The Real Mrs. Tobias? Actually, I think when it, I turned it in, I had the title, um, The Mother Load. You know, mm -hmm. it was a play on words with, you get it, okay. Yeah. But um, but my editor 
wanted a different title. So we kind of correct collectively, you know, came up with titles and decided to go in this direction. And your editor is Sarah Nelson, right? Yes, right. we're incredible Sarah Nelson. Yeah. yeah. And Sarah cool. actually worked at Book Report for a while. She was an editor ah. for about nine months, nine to 10 months, something like that. So yes, and we knew each other, all the other places to work. Yeah. She's a deep background in many. She was the editor of Publishers Weekly for a while. She was a magazine editor and a writer. She's, you know, very, very sharp and qualified. Mm -hmm. really I love seeing that you two are working together. It was very, very special for me to see that. Well, this was my second time to work with her. I also worked with her on the previous book, Another Side of Paradise, and she's great. Mm -hmm. And that was historical, correct? Am I right? That's the only time I've written a historical novel. It was about F. Scott Fitzgerald and a woman named Sheila Graham, who was his lover in Hollywood in the early 1940s. And in fact, he wound up dying in her home. Mm -hmm. But she was madly in love with him. She was a very interesting woman from England who was completely self-made. She was raised in an orphanage because her father had died and her mother was too poor to take care of her. And she um, broke off with her family at a, when she was still a teenager after she left this orphanage. And um, she made her, she reinvented herself. I'm always fascinated with people who can do that. Mm -hmm. Part of her reinvention ultimately when she was in about, about 20 years old was to move to the United States to try to become a gospel colonist. Not actually she should do something else first, but the, the idea was that she heard about syndication. It was something that they weren't doing yet in England and how you could write one article and it could be in 200 newspapers and you mm -hmm. could get much more. Mm -hmm. So she was a self-made and self-sufficient woman. Very interesting. Yeah, that's one. I think there's one book of yours I missed. I think it came out, was it come out in 2020? Or? Um, well, let's see. My second book was, I love it, it's possibly my, I don't want to say it was my favorite because that would be like saying his child was favorite, but it was called The Late Lamented Molly Marks. Yeah. And um, that, that book did really well. And um, it was told in two timelines, the same person. Once, when, one timeline she was alive and once she was dead. <laughs> but she had this ability to look down on people in her life and there were all these rules and she had a guide and he was also dead, but he was like a, um, a Boy Scout kind of who led her around and I love that book. And then the next book was called With Friends Like These. And it was about four friends whose friendship shatters and, and why. And it's not for the conventional reasons of someone having an affair or something like that. They were very contemporary reasons, like somebody like competing for the same job and mm -hmm. competing for the same apartment, you know, real estate fight. And, and I love like that book too. And then then my last, then the book that came after Slouching Toward Adulthood, which was the book about the teenagers, not the teenagers, people in their 20s and early 30s, was called The Widow Waltz. And it was the story of a woman who abruptly becomes a widow. Her, mm -hmm. You know how there's, whenever there's a big marathon or triathlon or something, there's always some man who has a heart attack or something like that. It's never a woman. Mm -mm. Women don't really, you know, stress out. They we would probably stop if they... <laughs> weren't feeling well, but men won't push themselves. And um, so this happens in, to this woman. So she's completely blindsided and then finds out there were irregularities, let's say, and she didn't have money. She had to figure out how to take care of herself. So that was that. And then came another side of paradise. A lot of books. <laughs> a lot of books. It really is. A lot of books in not that long a time either, especially with writing in different topics, writing in different, you know, it's not like I write the same book every time. I don't write the beach book every summer. I can't I don't yeah. do that. No, yeah. I, I keep changing around a little because there are things that I want to try to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before. I think that it could be interesting. Would you do historical again if you found the right topic? Yeah, I would. I would. I thought it was very interesting. I thought it might be easier, but it wasn't. I thought it might be easier because you, you can't stray that far from the facts. Mm -hmm. but you have to make up all the dialogue and you have to shape it all to, you don't just tell it chronologically, you have to shape it into a narrative. Mm -hmm. but, and you can't make a mistake. You have to make sure that you're telling it right. Yeah, your facts drive. Your it's facts drive. I love the cover of this. Did you have a hand in this? Yes, I did a little bit. I, I did say I wanted a really bright, bright color. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. It looks to me sort of like a, a drink, you know, a beautiful, like a tequila sunrise or some yes. kind of 
And then you can't probably tell it, but the, you know, this is the Brooklyn Bridge mm -hmm. toward Manhattan. And one family, the Bertie and her husband and child lived in Brooklyn, and the other two older women lived in Manhattan. So um, we couldn't squeeze Iowa into. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's too much to put on the cover. Too much to put on the cover. It's really terrific, though. How about the audio? Kendra Hoffman and Callie Blue are yes. the narrators. Did yes. you pick them? Yes, we did audition. And okay. I actually haven't heard the whole finished thing. I can't wait to hear it. Do you listen to audio heard. usually? Is is that something you do? Yes, or? I love audio. I'm reading. I'm I'm listening to a wonderful book now called Lessons in Chemistry. Mm -hmm. It's terrific. It's yeah. excellent. I'm really enjoying it. I I like to walk a lot, so I usually have something to listen to that for my walks. Right. Did I also see that you're reading the Stationery Shop? The, I am. Um, yeah, I just started it last night. I just saw that on um, Instagram, and I love that book. Absolutely love well, it. I interviewed uh, Arjan, so I believe I yeah I think I have an interview with her. You know, somewhere along the way, but I really really love that book. I do too. And when I opened it up, I always read the acknowledgments first because I want to see if I know anyone involved with the book. Yeah. It turns out it was Jackie. The editor was Jackie Cantor, who edited my my um, my my first book. The um, little pink slips. She was the. Uh, she wasn't the person who acquired it. The person who acquired it very sadly died Ooh. before we even had our first meeting. She was an iconic older editor in the industry. She had discovered Peyton Place in the slush mm -hmm. pile in the fifties or sixties, and um, she was evidently very elegant. And I was really thrilled. You know, the idea that I was going to have lunch with her and in the early January, but around December 15th, she died. Mm -hmm. so there was this huge funeral at um, Campbell's and Robert Gottlieb eulogized her. It was all very amazing to me. Mm -hmm. So I kind of felt like she was an angel on my shoulder through the mm -hmm. process because she had gotten behind that book. Yeah. And she understood it was going to be a good book. She understood that was going to be a story that would work. Mm -hmm. And Jackie saw the same potential in a stationary shop. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's a really good book. And Marjan is lovely. If you ever come across her, she's a really lovely person. Yeah. Now, are do you do book club? Do you work? Um, do you talk to book clubs? I love to talk to book clubs. And I think of all the books I've written, that this is the best one for a book club. Because after people chew through the book, there's so much territory in their own lives to get into. Daughters-in-law and mothers-in-law. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. So if people want to get in touch with you, go to your website, go to just sign up and say, want to talk to Sally? SallyCoslow.com uh, is my website. And um, now with Zoom, you know, you can do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. The one thing I tell people always is if you're going to ask Sally to do your book club, tell her what time zone you're in oh, and get yeah. all the details in the first email. Like, let's not do, I want you to speak. Then what day do you want me to speak? What times? Let's, let's save it for like one mail. Everybody's saying, I'm a busy, a busy woman. Yeah, exactly. She's got other things to do. Are you working on another novel or musing about another novel? I'm musing about a couple of novels. I just had a new idea today. I have like five ideas that are sitting with my agent and I've written I had a whole novel that I wrote during COVID that I might want to rewrite a little. And then I have 75 pages of a novel that I've just started. So I don't know what the next thing will be. Mm -hmm. I have a wonderful agent and I, you know, she, we have, she's been traveling a lot. So we need to talk. Yeah. And you sit there and say like, what's going to work and what's going to work commercially too, at this point as well, because we're to oh, read you know, but you don't know really because by the time it comes out, it's two, three years from now. Yeah, you're sitting there and you're you're trying to pull together like what are we still going to be super issue oriented? Are people where are people going to be at this point? And I'm I'm not quite sure. And I'm seeing what's selling and what's not selling this year. And it's it's interesting to sit there and say what's working, what's not. What do you think? Mm -hmm. See, what's your prediction? I, I think that people are looking for really smart, unique story. Like a lot of people are loving lessons in chemistry. Let's use that as an mm -hmm. example. And they like the character, they like the story, they like the story, the way the story unfolds. And it's not a typical story. And it's somebody who's, you know, neurodiverse, which we've had that kind of book before. The same thing with the success of The Maid earlier this year. I love that book too. It's a tightly told story. Mm -hmm. And when you sit there and finish it, and then there's great historical fiction. Like I thought the, um, I think it was The Magnificent Lives of Marjorie Post by Alison Pataki was a fabulous oh. novel. Yeah. And, historical fiction. My mother-in-law loved that book. I haven't read it yet. But 
there are things that we are going through the year and I'm trying to pick out these bets on. And I'm saying to people, I bet you're going to love this. I bet you'll love to discuss it with your book club. Mm -hmm. And some of them it's because of the character and some are because they're not going whatever the trend is right now. It's just a really, really well sculpted um, story. Here's another one. I knew nothing about tennis, nothing about, I couldn't understand 15, 40 love. Why? And I read the Carrie Soto book and then um, Taylor Jenkins read. And then all of a sudden I watched tennis Mm -hmm. We finished our editorial director loves watching tennis. And I said to him, when's the Australian open? He goes, it starts January 16th. And I was like, it'll be the middle of the night. I'll have to DVR. And if you told me that I could care less about the U S open, I wouldn't have believed it, but there was a book that brought me in and told me the story in a way that I understood it. So I think that it's, I think that people are still looking for good story, no matter what. I think people always look for good story. I think that sometimes we're getting trapped in, um, an agenda or this or that and we're forgetting about the, the idea of telling the story like we were there's the agenda that somebody's trying to put forth and the story doesn't quite gel with it and you could tell it if you wrote a better story that makes sense well i mean we all look for different things in books but i know you know i i look for high quality writing and mm -hmm. dialogue and i love as you pointed out lessons in chemistry which i've only read about the first quarter because i've been listening to it Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like how crisply written it is. It's, it's an outstanding book. Mm -hmm. um, I don't let myself finish something that's just kind of okay. Oh, no, me neither. I don't have time. I don't have time. And other people may really, really like it, but it's not going to do anything for me. And I'm not. The other one I really liked was um, Honor by Thridi Umberger, because I really liked. I read other things by her, but I haven't read the new one. Yeah, I had read something, it, you know, older one, but then here's an example. This has been a very busy year for me. So that's a book that came out in, I guess, February or March or something like January, February. I just read it now. So mm -hmm. I think that there's also this continuum of people, not everybody's getting here at this point. People are finding things as time goes on as well. And I think the long tail is longer than it was before if there builds a buzz about a book. Well, I just, I'm in two book clubs and I, one of them is reading a book called The, the, the Year of Meats by Ruth Ozeki. And I just adored it. And I, then I, when I was finished, I went to see, this book was in 2003. Yes. One yes. of the first books. And I did not realize that. It seemed very recent to me because it was new to me. I remember when that book came out because we're like a year of meat. And then it really took off. And we were like, really? Like, what is this book about? We remember we wrote, had a glowing review of it, but it's not the kind of thing you would really think. And it was way back when we started the company. It was. Yeah. yeah. And some of the stuff like, you know, popping back up, but then there's some stuff like that, that has legs. There are books like that, that have legs and then people, you know, find them later. What's your other book club reading? What's the other reading? Um, Deacon King Kong. Okay. By James McBride, which yes. I started and it's outstanding. He is just such a creative writer. I heard him talking about the book and he was so engaging on the whole story of what he was doing and why he was doing it. It was very, in fact, like when men sometimes present the books, it's very, this is what I'm going to do. And this is why I did it. And this is all this. Done. Okay, got it. Well, so. it, it's really good. I haven't finished it yet, but it's really great. So, so such a pleasure to talk to you as oh, always. You, Carol, it's nice to see you. I feel like we're in the same living room. Yeah, I do. I do too. And it was it's just really so much fun. I couldn't wait to talk to you about this because I purposely was um, said, I'm going to hold this, make sure I read it close to the time it's coming out because I want to be able to talk to her. So we, I'm looking forward to our readers hearing what they think about it as well. And really people for book club, you want to talk to Sally. Sally knows <laughs> a lot and she's a lot of fun to talk to. I noticed we had Japanese lunch more than once and it was just amazingly fun. The thing I miss is going out for like Japanese lunch. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that's the thing I miss most of all. Sushi lunches. You know? right. People aren't doing that now too much. No, they're not. They're just not. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank really you appreciate very it. much. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. We look forward to seeing you all next time on Book Reporter Talks 2.